So hi everyone, and welcome for participating in this new AITF alumni web series, where we will talk about innovative and disruptive healthcare. I'm Lucas Perez, I'm a strategic expert and author in health and aging solutions. And I'm also the French representative for one of the largest European network of entrepreneurs, companies, academics, and institutions called AITF alumni network. And that way, join the AITF alumni network now if you want to get some advantages of free event and reimbursed work trip regarding, of course, the eligibility rules for each of them and take a look and enjoy the opportunity. Before to start presenting Nesrin, I would like to inform you that we have free student passes and one 20% discount off for any alumni and future alumni willing to go to VivaTech event, which begins today in Paris. AITF alumni is a partner, an academic partner of VivaTech, and we, we have some tickets for you. So don't hesitate to directly contact me and I will give you this uh, free ticket and also this uh, promotional code for, uh, for you or all your colleagues. And now take a break and let's discuss. It's always a pleasure uh, to discuss with my interviewee about some interesting topics. And today we will discuss with Nesrin, Nesrin Benyaya, CEO of Dr. Data, a French company working hard to protect the personal data of patients, doctors, and all parties managing this type of sensitive data. She will tell us about her life, her background, her life bias, her, her company, and her feeling about the health personal data protection and how Nesrin, your blockchain-based solutions called Isalid, could be used to inform and collect patient consent for care and clinical trial with a high level of trustability. What is somewhere um, the essence of blockchain? If you have any question, don't be shy and please put them into the chat and we will answer them at the end in a Q&A session. So now, and before giving the floor to Nesrin, I would like to show you how that a privacy is more and more important nowadays. Here are some key findings about privacy. Here are some key findings illustrating some issues about European rights or European rights as European citizens on data protection and data valorization made by some data broker industry and big companies such as Google and Facebook, that everybody knows. The first point shows that 67% of Europeans have already heard of GDPR. But what's GDPR? The GDPR is this general data protection regulation that is a legal framework that sets guidelines for the collection and processing of personal information from all the people who live in the European Union. So it's important to say that all the people, not just the European citizen, but all the people concerned by data processing and concerned by the, the treatment of their personal uh, data and their health personal data, as Nestor uh, will show us. And that's a good sign. That's a good sign. The second point is the fact that there is more than 144,000 queries and complaints all across uh, the European Union from people contacting their national data protection. For instance, in France, it's the CNIL. The Commission Nationale Informatique et Liberté is the French name for, for this authority. In Germany, it's the Federal Commissioner for Data Protection and Freedom of Information by the acronym of BFDI. <clears throat> and in Spain, it's the Agencia de Protección de Datos. So, sorry for my Spanish accent, but it, it tells you that 
all the all the country each countries in Europe owns uh, its uh, proper national data protection authority and the question is why European citizen contact this national authority for the respect uh, of their rights firstly to ask a question about GDPR and all the requirements uh, related to the GDPR, and also uh, in, um, in some cases to simply lodge complaints about respect for their rights. And the last but not least, the last but not least, the last point shows us and raises question about how much is your personal data worth? As a Facebook user, even I'm not a Facebook user, your personal data is worth $6.42. It's the Facebook average revenue per user re regarding uh, different things and regarding uh, geographical areas such as US, Canada, Europe, Asia, and the rest of the world. It's an average, an average price um, regarding all this region. And for example, in, in US, Canada and Canada, uh, this average uh, revenue uh, is more important uh, than in Europe or than in Asia and than in, in the rest of the world. While it's, uh, it's more important in this, in this country. In this country, this average revenue per user is more important because they maybe have um, the ability to purchase uh, more uh, good and services regarding their salary, uh, regarding, uh, yes, some uh, patrimonial things. And all these uh, brokers, all these company managing uh, personal data uh, understand very well uh, this uh, logic. So now, and, it, and you understand that now it also means that personal data is worth gold personal data is worth gold and it's important to say that so now it's time to let nesrin speak about data privacy her company with a focus on sensitive data in a specific area that is healthcare so nesrin it's your turn and uh, I wish you all the best and thank you all for listening to me. Thank you, Luca. Uh, I hope you, you can see me. Uh, yes, it's okay. we can see you. Yes. Okay, great. Because Perfect. I can see you, that's why. <laughs> uh, thank you, Luca. Thank you for this great introduction, uh, for this invitation, for the organization of the, this interview, uh, because uh, since the pandemic, since the GDPR and then the pandemic, uh, we can see that uh, health data uh, enters into the, into the public debate uh, for everyone, uh, even the person who doesn't know anything about data or technology. Uh, that is important because uh, when it comes to process uh, health data, it also comes to our freedoms uh, and individual rights. Uh, so that's why is uh, how what, why processing health data is so much sensitive. Uh, so I'm the screen. Uh, I got a PhD in law, in health law. So I worked uh, in the health industry uh, in the past few years, uh, and then in uh, legal fields. And I created uh, Dr. Data maybe four years ago. I don't, it's going so fast. Uh, more than four years ago, uh, just before uh, the enforcement of GDPR, uh, with the aim to uh, support uh, hospitals, but also startups uh, in e-health uh, industry, in e-health, uh, to protect patients' uh, data and to be uh, compliant with GDPR, but not only GDPR, with every local laws, uh, because when it comes to health, it's uh, global. Uh, when you are doing clinical trial, it's not just clinical trial with French patients. It's also with Italian patients, German patients, American patients. So it's very global, uh, this issue. So this is our main goal at the beginning. 
uh, and we work as a data protection officer. You maybe heard this, uh, this uh, famous name. Uh, so as a DPO, uh, we have a, a huge responsibility because we are telling to our customers, to our partners, how they can deal with health data, how they can share this health data, how they can uh, do valorization of this health data for academic research or for creating companies to develop AI algorithm, for instance. So it's very complicated. Uh, I'm not sharing slides, I'm just talking. I, I love to talk first. <laughs> so I will share slides just after. Uh, and then uh, this is our main job. And from this main job, uh, we were dealing with some experiences on, on the field uh, in clinical research, and we were facing patients. patients who wanted to uh, withdraw the consent, for instance, patients who wanted to have access to the data, patients who wanted to object to the processing of the health data. So we were facing these patients by emails mostly, uh, by, yeah, by, by, by phones, uh, by phones sometimes. And we were like frustrated to not get, uh, to not have a solution, a technical solution to track uh, every patient's right and to be sure that uh, researchers or healthcare professionals are doing good uh, with the right decision of the patients. So that's why we created a solution named uh, Isalid, uh, which is a solution uh, based on blockchain, uh, more precisely on smart contract, uh, to collect the consent of the patient or the opt-out of the patient, because sometimes it's opt-in or opt-out of the patient, uh, about the processing of its data uh, and for the for the treatment for the healthcare too, so I will share my slide because I think you are waiting for my slide too much. <laughs> so screen one, <laughs> you can see them. Yes, we can see it. Great. So that's how we're talking about. <laughs> so we are data protection officers, and uh, yeah, I'm not even, I'm not used to use slides, so I love to talk more. Uh, and yeah, we work in France, but not only in France, uh, since it's global, we work with other regulations in Africa, in the US, uh, in the Middle East also, uh, and you know, in the UK, because the UK is not part of the European Union, so there is, uh, there are also some specific rules also. Uh, and I was talking about this, uh, this solution we developed is a lead, and uh, we were uh, the first uh, French patent, and I think the first European one since we are uh, we are dealing with the uh, uh, European Office of Patents. Uh, so this is like you know um, something something with a lot of involvement uh, from our team because we are a team of uh, uh, legal people, DPO people. We have a doctor with us. We have uh, developers, so a technical team dedicated to this solution. Uh, because we really believe uh, that the data must be protected, minute, minute closed, you know. Uh, you, we need to use that, this data for research. We can see that from the pandemic. Uh, we cannot live like something uh, uh, closed in our homes with our data and doing nothing. Uh, so we, we are, our will is to create like an environment of trust between stakeholders and these stakeholders are patients, healthcare professionals, startups, uh, industry, etc. And this is the aim of our solution. So we were like a trusted third party, which is like the contrary of the use of the blockchain, but uh, I like to, to, to say that because this is our main role uh, for now, because they trust us because we, uh, we know the regulations well. We're not just a software publisher like that. So that's what, what is Dr. Data. So we're based in France at Paris, in Paris Santé Campus, which is the huge co campus of health data created by the government last year uh, with, uh, I don't know, I think like 100, more than 100 startups and in, uh, industry in this campus. Uh, so you, it's just near Vivatech <laughs> uh, Congress. So you can, you can uh, just go uh, and visit the, the campus. Uh, so that's what we what we do, and we are like more than ten people, and we're growing. And you know, as I say, uh, for us, it's like God plus GDPR. Uh, I will not 
give you a, a lesson, a training about GDPR. But you know, this is uh, uh, the enforcement of the GDPR is like has been a key event uh, for us, uh, but for the awareness of all the stakeholders uh, in the field of data protection. In France, we had we had and we have uh, now uh, a national law, and some other countries in the European Union had their national law, uh, and. The, the French law is like really binding. Uh, it's the, the, the more, I, I don't know any, any, any law, any national law uh, so hard on data protection. So you can uh, understand that with GDPR uh, for French people, uh, it's like nothing GDPR when you have such law, uh, but it's not the case. Some stakeholders discovered uh, with GDPR the, the need to protect the data, you know, the, the, the rule, the security measure to implement, it's like, whoa, uh, we, this is a new thing. No, it's not a new thing for French people, but this is the, uh, the sense uh, we had. So the GDPR has been, uh, so a kind of revelation, it, led to, it has led to changes in practices, uh, a large investments, uh, but also it has led to a kind of change in culture. We, now we talk about the culture of privacy, even in healthcare, even within a hospital, uh, which is what was not the case before GDPR. So with the, uh, its entry in, into force on May 2018, uh, hospitals, the industry, and even patients' organization um, became aware that the health data have a value and that the protection of this health data uh, was threatened both by external and internal uh, threats. So this is a big revelation for people, you know, because the health data, I will say that after, uh, has more value than your credit card, uh, that, that your, your bank account. Uh, so it's uh, difficult to understand because people think that the sensitive data is more the data uh, that someone can use and store your money. Uh, but no, when I can have your health data, I will not use your credit card data because with the health data, I can do anything. Uh, you can cancel your credit card. You cannot uh, come back and, uh, and ask me to, to return your health data. You know, I, I can uh, use your health insurance number. I can do uh, identity theft. I can sell this data. This data, it's like 300. We will say that after $300 um, dollars for a medical record. So it's really huge when you, you can see that a uh, credit card number is uh, like eight or nine or ten dollars max. So this is a real revelation. Uh, and the sensitivity of the data is not about the money I can tell from you. It's about how the data is sensitive for your freedoms and individual rights. That's why in the GDPR, you have genetic data, biometric data, religious data, health data, uh, political data, which are sensitive and not bank data. Not so that's a, a big understanding. So the GDPR, now you can see my screen, yeah. The GDPR has introduced golden rules. This is the, like the Bible for everyone who wants to process the personal data, uh, whatever it's health data or, or not health data. So these famous golden rules are the rules that guide all the processing in any field, in any scale. Uh, the processing of personal data first must be legal. It can be obvious when you know it, it, it's, it's nice to to repeat this thing, <laughs> it's a, you need to, to have a, a legal processing. So with a legal basis, even a contract, the consent of the patient, a legal obligation, etc. So you need to uh, assess this uh, lawfulness. And then you uh, have to be specific on the purpose of the processing. Uh, it must be legitimate, justified, uh, and the data you will process mostly, the, the must be the the only data you need to process to fulfill this purpose, uh, you need to limit this data storage retention. So you will not uh, uh, store the data like 10 years if uh, you can use it only for one or two years. 
uh, this is a big step because you know in health, uh, since you can have uh, conditions, problems, uh, etc. Uh, when we begin our, our activity, we work with some uh, French hospitals and they told us, oh, we keep uh, the data for the life. And I answered them, for the life of who? <laughs> for the life of the patient, for your life, for the life of your children? I don't know. Uh, so, you know, it's like, oh, we keep this for life. Uh, and now you have a uh, data storage limitation and sometimes you have uh, a legal text to, to, to do, to, to, to tell you how you can, how, how many you can, how many times you can store the data. Sometimes you have nothing and you need to assess this thing. And yeah, of course, we need to, to implement security measures, which are technical measures, but also organizational measures. So about the technical ones, it's simple, you know, it's encryption, uh, good storage data, uh, you can control the access to the data, etc. And for the organizational ones, uh, it's about procedures, how you are doing the awareness of your people within the organization, to tell them that processing data and mostly health data is important and risky, etc. So this is about uh, documentation, like a QMS, you know, quality management system. So GDPR is like not really a legal text, but a quality one, technical one, uh, and regulatory one. So you have like all things you can find in the norms and standards, international standards. And then uh, this is the, the main purpose of the GDPR. You need to ensure the people's rights. Uh, so people need to have to get the information. How do you process the personal data? This is an obligation. Uh, you need to explain them uh, to them the, their rights, how they can exist as their rights, and they can fulfill a complaint within the authority. So as Lucas said, uh, in France, it's the CNIL, uh, but each country in the European Union has its own uh, data protection authority. So this is the main thing. Why? Because you know each authority has too many things to do and you are just too many to control. <laughs> so it's impossible for each authority to control everyone. So the, the high level of risk, it's really with the, the people rights. So it really with the concerned person you are processing the data. And for our case, the patients. Why? Because the patients can go to the judge, the patients can form a class action, uh, etc. So that's a, this is a big risk uh, because the, the, the authority uh, do, does not know you, uh, you know, you are, you are too many. But if the patients are fulfilling too many complaints to the authority and like, oh, OK, this is the organization is coming uh, too many. To, to, too many, too many times. What, what is this organization? What is it? What is doing with the papers, right? With the health data of these people, etc. So, up, uh, uh, your control. So, this is what happened. The risk is not the authority, really. It, it's the authority if you're Google, Facebook, uh, Amazon, Microsoft, you know, the big ones. Uh, but for a small hospital, it's not that. Uh, and then, uh, something we uh, have worked on on the consent. The consent is not always uh, the legal basis of the data processing. It's, you know, when you hire a person, you have legal obligation, you have to ask her uh, the social security number, uh, you need to, to, to get the bank account to, to, to pay the person, etc. You know, this is legal obligation, it's not about consent. And sometimes it's all about consent. And the consent uh, has criteria, several criteria. So it must be free, specific, informed, so the person must understand what are you telling to, 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 to her uh, and then give the consent. It must be unambiguous. So one question, one consent. Not one question with several uh, demands and requests and you ask the consent for all or for nothing. So this is not only for France, it is everywhere. In the US, you, it's called the informed consent simply, uh, but th this is everywhere. So these are the garden rules of GDPR. I don't know if uh, there are questions, I, can, I cannot see you. Uh, so in concrete terms, um, in the field of health, you know, in healthcare, this means uh, that the data must be at least encrypted 
and stored at a health data hosting facility, which is the case in France. You know, France, we have a lot of rules. Nothing, no one has this kind of, kind of rules. Uh, when you use health data for care, uh, for instance, uh, you need to store this health data in a specific uh, facility uh, that gets a certification to do so by a, by a, um, by a notified body, etc. Uh, so this is only for France. So it, maybe it comes to European Union. Uh, so that's 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 a specific things. Uh, you need also to manage the rights to the people accessing to the data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In addition to this, there are uh, very specific rules as for France, like I, I said, from country to country in the healthcare area. Uh, in Germany, you have other rules, many. You are, you, you, uh, in Germany, they will ask you to store the data within the country, for instance. Some, land, some landers will ask you that. Uh, in the United States, uh, they will ask you the same. Uh, so, you know, for health, there is a lot of differences between the countries. And which is uh, something uh, making the GDPR really weak because the aim purpose of GDPR is to create a unique uh, regulation uh, across all the European Union on all fields, but it's not uh, it's not uh, the case. So in short, you know, data protection is a lot of common sense above all. So you don't want someone to store your house, so you look it up. It's so simple. Uh, if you don't want someone to access to your personal things, personal data uh, within your house, you will use a key, you will use a camera surveillance, you know, you, you will implement all the security measures you can do. So it's it's really, really common sense. And we have uh, other other topics to discuss around because there are some, some, some controversial topics. So health data protection is happening really on two levels. We just talk about privacy. So the French rules for us, for instance, you have other rules in other country, how you can reuse the health data for research because when a patient is coming to a hospital to get some treatments, uh, you are generating health data from, I don't know, medical images, uh, from his medical record, etc. And you can reuse this health data for research to create data lakes, for instance, etc. So there are um, uh, regulation on that, and it's different between country to country. So this is the, like, about privacy. But you have one other thing, important thing, uh, and, and I think it's it's really since the pandemic that it's uh, it's growing. It's about sovereignty. What is sovereignty? You can you can say to me. Uh, so sovereignty for our our uh, our topic, it's really about who can access to the data. Who control this access to the data? As you know, there has been a lot of controversy about the Cloud Act, you know, with the former Donald Trump, etc., uh, about American interference in European data, mostly. This is really a political issue more than a regulatory one. Uh, I think you, we can fight between regulations, uh, and it's a, it's a good thing to fight between regulations. But sovereignty is now used for political reasons, you know. Uh, but on the ground, there is a real impact. Uh, we'll give you an example. In France, like two years ago, uh, the CNIL, so the French Authority on Data Protection, decided to stop clearly uh, the government's Health Data Up project. So the Health Data Up project, it's a governmental project. Uh, who wanted to uh, centralize all the health data from all hospitals and create like a big data store, health data store, uh, to reuse the health data with industry academic for research. So this was the big project, uh, a national one. So the French authority decided to, to stop this because this health data hub chooses to use Microsoft to store the data. Even if it's Microsoft servers in Paris or in European Union, uh, it, it can be right for the French authority. Uh, so this has shaken up um, the whole world uh, of health data in France, uh, not uh, anywhere else, but because as you know, most artificial intelligence companies, industry, uh, 
players, etc., are using either Microsoft, Amazon, or Google, because uh, you know you have a, a powerful uh, calculation uh, to do some some machine learning, etc. Uh, and this can be good because we are, as a DPO, uh, representing this kind of companies uh, what at the time uh, of this decision of the French security was like afraid. Uh, it was like, okay, we have no business to do in France now, you know? Uh, and this was very, very, very alarming because uh, at the end, these companies uh, who... Uh, for some of them of French companies with French founders wanted really hard to work with French companies here, French data hosting, et cetera. But there was no, no means, there was no offers, service offers, service providers to do so, to do the same services like Google or Amazon. This is a big problem. So Germany has, has um, the same rule now, you know, for American people, etc. Uh, so France and Germany are like uh, together on <laughs> that. And you have some other countries who are following within the European Union. Uh, so this is a big issue. And, you know, with uh, the last uh, uh, events uh, in Ukraine and Russia, etc. Uh, one month or two months ago, we had an announcement about privacy C2.0. So a new agreement between the USA and the European Union to uh, have a legal framework to transfer the data from European Union to the US. Uh, and you know, when you, well, I was, talk, I was talking to about transfer and American Cloud Act, it's not really when you are sending data from European Union to the USA. Uh, the data can be within the European Union, but somehow, someone uh, in the USA have access to this data to do, I don't know, support, maintenance, etc. cetera. Uh, this is a transfer too. So this is not legal too. So that's why uh, we had this big announcement with no legal text. So we're waiting, <laughs> we're just waiting. But you know, this is a timing. Uh, and uh, some, some people here uh, told that it's like the data uh, and the gas uh, negotiation since the political event uh, we have in the last three months. So, you know, when you're dealing with privacy and sovereignty and then you have, you are in the health data, is really complicated. <laughs> you need to all, all the rules to, to follow all the, the Twitter accounts of uh, people uh, having this kind of discussions uh, at this national level uh, and it's really hard to, to, to follow. Uh, but we can do a lot of things. So you will ask me one question. Can we still innovate with health data? Yes, it's, it's complicated, but it's, it's not impossible. Uh, so I will say something uh, about the, the innovation in health data. So uh, you know in health data, uh, in, in healthcare, you can use the health data for treatment. So it's, it's okay to do so. It's uh, even mandatory. You cannot uh, uh, give, uh, I don't know, a patient treatment if you don't know the patient, if you don't have uh, the medical records of the patient. But you can also use this data for remote patient monitoring, etc. And to do so, you have several rules, several steps to follow. The first one is to assess your processing. So this is called a privacy impact assessment, so PIA. Uh, and this, it, it's a risk analysis. It's, it's basically this, uh, this uh, risk analysis. And you will describe every step of the processing, every security measures you implemented or you will implement. And you will just analyze the risk that, I don't know, someone can have access to this data with no authorization, or someone can modify this data with no authorization, or someone can just erase the data uh, and it was not uh, a will from uh, the organization. So you have three risks, the integrity of the data, the confidentiality of the data, and the availability of the data. And you will process this assessment. Uh, so that's what DPO do uh, mostly of the time. And you will use some kind of uh, security tools like pseudonymization. So you will protect the real identity of the patients. You will respect also his right to opt in or his right to opt out. You will do encryption because you like 
you will like adding some barriers to hackers or I don't know internet threats to you will use the identification. So the identification it's like anonymization, but we really do not believe in strict anonymization in how you word. I don't know if you can be anonymous uh, when you have uh, such kind of, of data. And you can use also data segregation. For instance, you know, uh, there are so many companies uh, in France, I was talking about sovereignty, American uh, cloud app, etc. But you have so many uh, actors, big players, uh, you know, in uh, health in France using Amazon to store the health data. Uh, but they do this kind of data segregation. So they will store the identity of the patient somewhere else. Uh, they will encrypt data on Amazon and ke ke keep the keys encryption uh, within the French company. For, you know, uh, this is what Dr. Lee do. This is what other companies are doing. Um, so this is kind of, uh, you know, security puzzle <laughs> you need to do. Uh, and then uh, you have to, to respect the patient's rights and to be full transparent. This is the, the, the main thing, I think, the, the, key, the key element you need to have in mind, to keep in mind, uh, because with no transparency, there is no trust. Uh, I, I think uh, we, we, we've seen that the, during the pandemic. And that's why we developed easily our solution to create this, this link of trust between all the stakeholders, to tell to the patients when you are saying yes or when you are saying no, no one can modify this decision. No one can enter this decision. You are the only one to have this key because we are using this blockchain and no one can do this, even us. So this is really important because it's like a high level uh, high level of, of proof, high level of integrity, high level of, of traceability. Uh, I don't, I don't know any 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 levels more uh, about blockchain. I don't know blockchain for me is the, really the best technology to do so. Uh, it's not about Bitcoin. It's not about uh, NFT, etc. It's really about the core of the technology, uh, and. We need to democratize this technology, you know, you need to explain to the patient because, you know, for, uh, I don't know, maybe 99% of the people, uh, they do not know that the health data uh, is used uh, by another company or by industry or by research within the hospital. You know, so the most, most people are like, okay, I'm going to the hospital, uh, I'm receiving a treatment, uh, they ask me my social security number, I have medical imaging, and that's it. You know, they ev don't even know that they, they can, uh, the, the researcher can use this data for, uh, for other things. Uh, so we're coming from really, really far, <laughs> you know, to expand this to patients. Uh, we not uh, create like a fear system uh, because it's not um, how, how we are. So, so the data in healthcare, we have some use cases. So uh, really uh, the big one uh, we, we have uh, in, in France now, and, and I think it's the same in Portugal, in Germany, uh, is uh, what we call data lakes or data warehouses. So each hospital wants to create a, its data warehouse uh, with all the health data from care and reuse this data for internal research or with for partnerships with industry, big pharma, or AI startups, etc., and do this kind of valorization. It's like it's not selling the data because it's forbidden by the law and punished by the law by prison, uh, but uh, it's like doing the valorization of all the services uh, because you will structure the data, you will protect the data, you will do this privacy subject assessment, uh, you will inform. Uh, and get the consent of the patient. So, so this is a war organization, and for everyone who wants to this access to this kind of data, compliant data, quality data, uh, so there is a price. Uh, and this is the big one. So you have the secondary use of data for research before creating data warehouses. You also are the sharing data between GPs and hospitals, the remote patient monitoring, you know, uh, with the pandemic, it's like growing uh, mostly for chronic diseases like cardiac disease and diabetes. And you have the big one, artificial intelligence uh, with no bias. 
uh, because in AI, with a small amount of data, like, I don't know, uh, a data set of uh, 100 people is nothing. Uh, it's not something you can use on a large scale. So that's why we, we need a lot of data, quality data, and compliant data. So this is a big, a big one. And big pharma is really turning into AI to make drug discovery. Uh, some companies, and uh, I'm thinking to, uh, to, to one French one. So, you know, so we have, we have uh, talked about this uh, privacy, how we can use the health data, et cetera. But, you know, we need, we need to protect uh, this health data. With this culture of privacy, we have also a cyber uh, security privacy. So you have cyber risk. So what is a cyber risk? Uh, so for a company, when you are uh, protecting the data, doing so much investment, uh, I don't know, I'm taking the example of a hospital with creating a data warehouses uh, within the, the its region. There was uh, so many inference. Um, you need to, to be sure that uh, no one will steal your data because you are doing such a good job and selling the services of this good job. So imagine if someone is stealing the data, you have uh, no value uh, at the end. So this is a big, uh, uh, big thought to have. So for a company, cyber risk is like this probability uh, that such event recurs. So isolation of the integrity, as I said, corruption. Uh, some, uh, sometimes you have targeted uh hacking uh, cyber attacks some, sometimes is massive in germany one person died of a cyber attack you know because this person was uh in the surgery and the system just um got, goes down and she died uh, so you know so the risk when you do it when you're doing the privacy impact assessment the risk is not just only financial reputational Oh, etc. It's also uh, death, so it's like a creepy job to, <laughs> to be DPO, but an interesting one. Uh, so yeah, you have this kind of events who can who can occur like espionage, self disclosure, etc. You have cyber insurance even now. You have insurance to to deal with that specifically. Uh, so it's it's a big 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 um, uh, big thing uh, now in, in in our 21st century. So three numbers, five million. Five million, that's the number of people who were affected by data breach in France last year. It's, it's really big. Uh, I think the last, uh, the year before, it was like two, of, two million. Uh, 5,000, that's the number of data breach reported to the CNIL, so to the French authority last year. It's like 20 data breach per day. So it's big. And you know, we, we, we were faced with this kind of data breach for our customers. And you know, when it happens, it always, I think like 90% of the time, the Friday nights, you know, before your weekend. So you're really happy because you have 72 hours to go, to do this notification to the French authority, whatever it's the weekend or I don't know, holidays. So it's kind of tricky. Uh, and 4 million, more than 4 million, that's the average cost of a data breach last year. It's huge. Uh, and this is a financial cost. Uh, it can be human costs. So this is uh, very interesting also to, 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 to check. So the ENISA, it's the European um, Cybersecurity Agency. Uh, and they are doing reports every year. Uh, so these numbers have been increasing rapidly uh, since the pandemic. And in my opinion, they will continue to do so because the digitalization of the healthcare uh, is accelerating and the vigilance is not fully in place. You know? uh, and uh, this first figure shows us the timeline of incident in terms of affected sectors. So you can see here the healthcare, the, the healthcare and medical sector. And you can see in gray, like in like at the end of the, the, the two years ago and last year in May, how it's growing. And now healthcare, can you see the spike? Healthcare is like at the same level at governments, you know, like, you know, 143 incident, and we all like uh, at least, yeah, 200 here for governments. It's, it's really huge, you know, because when you're uh, uh, hacking, uh, I don't know, all hospitals in the country, you're just blocking the country. It's uh, essential services. 
not kill. Uh, so it's a strategic, strategic ones. It's like you are attacking, I don't know, the Ministry of Def Defense or military de ministry. So it's a big, big, big services, big services in the country. So you can see also here, uh, this is second figure that healthcare is a targeted sector for us. These are the numbers uh, from, from the ENISA uh, between April 2020 to July 2021. So really, really at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, you know, when you're weak, when you're fragile, uh, uh, you're like a temptation to hackers uh, because they can enter really easy in your system. Uh, and during the pandemic, uh, the hospital opened this IT system because, uh, like, for, from a day to another, they were they were doing uh, telemedicine. They were installing like uh, implementing uh, other IT systems, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, with no additional means to do so. Okay, with no additional resources in IT teams to do so. So I can uh, let you imagine uh, the risks uh, increasing. And we can see also the incident in healthcare, uh, more precisely, month by month since April to May, and you see the spike here. This is really huge, uh, you know, in healthcare. Uh, and you have four main, four main sources uh, for data leakage. So the exploitation of unpatched vulnerabilities, I think you know all of them, uh, the configuration errors, the lack of IT security controls, internal threats, you know, uh, when you fire someone, someone who have uh, who had all access to all IT systems, systems, this person must be maybe not happy and can do uh, really bad things, uh, you know. So you have to be aware of uh, how your people have access to the data. How you can you can just um, cut this access uh, at the end. So this is really important. So you can say to me, why you here? Why not? <laughs> Uh, why well, yeah, Because you have a big volume of data in a single place. It's like a happy place for a kid, you know. Uh, it's the most sensitive and valuable data. Uh, you have a digital dependency to providers. You know, when a hospital has a software provider uh, used like uh, for 10 years, 20 years, uh, to make it change it, it's really difficult because it's whole uh, change commitment. Uh, it's, re it's really heavy. Uh, and you have fragile and awkward organization because this kind of organi organization share data with GPs, share data with uh, people uh, who are doing the transport of patients between home and, and hospital. They are ev at any time of the day sharing data with someone. Uh, so it's all risk for, for, for this hospital. And on the dark market, you can see if you have uh, uh, an access to this kind of uh, website, uh, that's a medical record. It's about like three, three, uh, three hundred dollars. Uh, imagine when you have a rare, a rare disease, a thousand dollars. This is really huge. That's why people are, are, are like uh, uh, hacking this kind of data and then selling it. And this is the external threats. And you have internal threats when you are working with uh, uh, service providers, applica mobile applications, on health, uh, because you know the. The, 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 the sentence, uh, if it's free, uh, it's because you are the product. So uh, this is the kind of things you can uh, to keep, um, to keep in mind uh, because people are used to not pay to services, to digital services. But there is a, a, a business model for this kind of service providers. They can live without, uh, without, uh, without money. So uh, your data is the product. And sometimes you are paying for the, for the services but your data is still the product. I'm thinking to uh, all IoT, you know, when you're uh, buying a watch uh, to, 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 uh, to measure your cardiac rhythms, et cetera, you buy the watch, so you are giving money, but you're producing data too. So, you know, it's very really important to, to keep this in mind because your privacy uh, is really intimate. You know, when it's gone, it's finished. You cannot uh, uh, come, uh, I don't know, uh, just erase this access, etc. So it's really important to have this, uh, this in mind. So how much is your data worth? You know, this is from the dark web, uh, uh, the, the $300. Uh, but, you know, in the team, our team, we were so frustrated because we were talking with data brokers and we 
we had no information, real information. You know, when you when you see when you are a data broker and you see someone with the name Dr. Data with a PhD in Headflow asking how much you are selling the data, uh, you have just uh, you, you have you have you have just the fear that something is going bad. So we did this great job with a school in France, uh, so an engineering school, uh, to try to find this uh, information. So how how much the data is worth. So we create a simulator. You can find on the internet. So uh, this is here the uh, the link, uh, which is same as screen uh, after, uh, and you can see on um, your civil status, your family situation, uh, your your revenues, your health condition. Uh, what is uh, the price of your data for so 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 many so many providers, so many data brokers? So uh, it's based on sources. Uh, we can we can. Uh, you can, you can find it when you click here on the website. Uh, it was really difficult. It's not exhaustive, it's not complete, because as you know, data brokers are not uh, uh, really, uh, I don't know, involved in such a kind of, of solution. Uh, it's anonymous, you can go and we are not processing data, there is no cookie uh, on the website. Uh, and this is something used to raise awareness of people, that when you share something, it's like innocent for you, but it's not innocent for everyone, you know, and there is a price and just to raise this awareness. It's not stop using digital services. You cannot live uh, without, I don't know, some, some kind of services. Uh, you, you're using an iPhone or a Samsung, Samsung phone or, I don't know, uh, uh, Huawei, which is a China phone. It's fair. So uh, we are like stuck in this kind of uh, world, but you can be aware and just uh, make efforts to protect your privacy every day when you can and when you know. Uh, so this is a, uh, the final the final job we, we, we did. Uh, and two things to keep in mind. Uh, I think for every, every stakeholder, patients, uh, industry, uh, hospitals, etc., uh, the data is individually available but collectively powerful. So that's why uh, uh, we are uh, uh, giving training to patients, organizations, to explain to them that the data is important for research, okay? It, we need to protect the data, we need to ensure the patient's rights, etc., cetera, to, to be compliant with the laws and the regulation, but we cannot just stop using this data. We have guarantees we need guarantees to do so and for researchers who have like big data sets every day on the excel file all in all at the system on the virtual machines we're explaining to them that behind each line of data there is a person there is an individual and they need to keep this in mind it's just like numbers uh, weights uh date of birth etc uh, it's a, p a person behind uh, and when this stakeholder or like the opposite uh, or just keeping this in mind, I've understood this, it's a huge step, you know, because they will respect themselves. You know, no, this is this is really the, the, the mind spirit of the, the data uh, and what you are doing on the field uh, with all these stakeholders. So maybe Luca I can share the simulator. Do you want to play with it? Yes, yes, Nesrin. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a little bit scared uh, to be your uh, experimental subject, but uh, yes, I'm ready. I'm ready to, to, test, to okay. test it. Yeah. <laughs> if, you want, I, I can, if you want, I can do that uh, uh, directly from my screen, if you want, yeah. or... Okay. You can, okay, you can so. go. There is, a, there is a French and English version. Yeah. Okay. So I'm switching on the on the English version, so you can see my screen. Yes. Okay. Perfect. So let me. Uh, okay. <laughs> so that this is uh, you know uh, when you're on the first step, this is our civil status. So just uh, when you click uh, on the data on the information. Uh, it's not like uh, you, uh, we will um, ask you uh, our gender or your age. Just here you click on the sex and the ethnicity, you can just see here. Okay. okay. 
uh, you know, the price, yeah, uh, on the right, the price is growing, is increasing and on the right. So because if you, if someone have your gender and your ethnicity, this is the data, uh, this is the price, you can sell it. Yeah. You know? Okay, so let uh, me just modify this. Library, PowerPoint, title. Okay, sorry. Okay. And okay. And then, okay, it's maybe better. Yeah. And okay. uh, so the aim is not to disclose any information uh, about you, Luca, but uh, you can just try. If you have a judicial record, you can say yes, uh, just to, to say, uh, yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. You know, fifteen dollars <laughs> directly. So this is the kind of information really, really uh, valuable. You know, uh, you have a driver license, so you have different uh, category of the of data. So here you are on civil status, family situation. If you're married, if you have children, uh, you are like a, a good target for advertising uh, for companies selling. Uh, uh, things for babies, uh, for children. So you you can see the price just growing, just growing. Are you okay. expecting children? Yes, it's gro it's growing uh, very fast, and it's scary yeah. <laughs> in the meanwhile. <laughs> <laughs> and you know we don't have we don't have the last information because the data brokers wanted to tell us. But you know, and for health, this is the interesting one. If you have a, sp a specific health condition, uh, you can see yes, uh, for instance. And then uh, if you have, it depends on how many conditions you have. You can like, I don't know, check for two and it's growing uh, since the have con more you have condition, more it's growing uh, because oh, you can be, uh, you can be tired. Ah, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a polypathology <laughs> guide. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's huge. And you know, there is, it's just an information of how many conditions you have. It's not really what is the condition you have and your medical records. It's just that you have a condition and how many. Uh, and this is already a valuable information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, and when you're um, uh, doing your research on the net, etc., you have uh, your IP address is used. You know, just recently uh, the French authority and I think the uh, the German one. Uh, Talk to every uh, website uh, providers to stop using Google Analytics. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, this is kind of a of move. Uh, if, then your economic situation, if you have a loan, if you have, you are a owner or a tenant also, because if you are owner, we we will suppose that you have money to earn mm -hmm. something. So uh, yeah. so you have a specific target. Um, when you are on the internet and consumer goods also. Uh, you talked at the beginning of the the, the webinar that uh, uh, Facebook, uh, every social media has a revenue per user. Uh, you can find this is public. Uh, it's uh, it's the law for uh, for them, and you can find it. Well, you, you see, <laughs> you're like a hundred euros. When, when I when I show this uh, this simulator to a friend at the beginning, uh, she asked me, "How can I get this money?" <laughs> <laughs> it's impossible. You cannot do so. But uh, you, we, we can raise an, an ethical question. You know, uh, will you really sell your data uh, if you are sure you will get this amount of money? Um, is uh, is something eth ethical? I don't know because someone really wealthy will not need to do so. So someone else wealthy will keep uh, its data for for, for him. You know, uh, but someone with no real money, maybe he will do this. So, mm -hmm. which is the the balance? Where, where, where is the balance between this kind of money and the ethical? So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so and 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 we we already see uh, all the the importance and all the the weight of uh, social media in the mm -hmm. in the data collecting, uh, data processing, mm -hmm. and data valorization. So we just reached we just uh, reached uh, one thousand uh, one sorry one one hundred two euros, and yes, it, it it's scary to see that this uh, these big companies uh, through the advertisement uh, some uh, campaigns use our data uh, to make money. But 
it's the game. It's the game. So we are. Are um, we are we ready to pay for services? Yeah. You know. And it's the uh, game. Facebook, Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg raised this question uh, two years ago. Uh, okay, you don't want to you uh, you don't want them to use data and do this advertising. So you will pay like seven or ten dollars uh, for your account on Facebook. Who will pay when you are used so many years to get this free? Uh, and even if you are paying, how can you trust this kind of company? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. you know. So this is a big system. You, know? <laughs> you can uh, you can have big thoughts. You can you can do philosophy on that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, we we had a question uh, from Antonio, and so you you brilliantly present uh, the legal stuff of your solution, and there there are maybe some technical uh, points uh, to address. And Antonio uh, said us that could you could you elaborate more on the encryption method. I am guess these are the technical solutions, but does it also include pseudonymization of the data? Okay. Because you, so, you didn't uh, talk, if uh, unless I'm mistaken, you, you didn't talk about uh, pseudonymization uh, of, uh, of the data. Hmm. So the, the, the encryption and the pseudonymization are two different things. They are both security measures. But when I'm doing encryption, I can do encryption on uh, uh, identifying data, you know, with the name, the first name, date of birth, and encrypt this data. But uh, it will be more uh, strong if I can do this, this pseudonymization. So there is a difference between pseudonymization and anonymization, okay? So the pseudonymization, I will give an ID, to an individual, I will erase the name, the first name, everything directly identifying to this individual. But I will keep this ID. And somewhere I will keep uh, this reference table between the ID and the direct identity. So pseudonymization is like another barrier. So when you have a data set, first you will do this pseudonymization if you can do so, because uh, if someone uh, will have access to this data set, they will know, never know the identity of the patient. They will know the identity of the patient if they have also access to the reference table. You know, so you have to it's segregation between the ID and the direct identity. But it will be stronger if on the data set uh, you did the pseudonymization, you also do this encryption. So this is really different things you can use at the same time to have stronger security measures and the anonymization by definition is like you never can, you can never return to the identity of the patient so you have no id no reference table somewhere else uh, so it's like aggregated data it's really difficult to get this anonymization in health data because uh, for instance in a rare disease you may have only one or two people in the, the country with this disease, so it's really easy to, to find them at the end. Okay, so thank you, Nesrin, for uh, for your uh, yes for for your answer. Um, we we also read some uh, some messages from Miriam, and Miriam highlighted uh, the fact that GDPR uh, GDPR compliance um, has a cost as a cost and it uh, it benefits uh, to certain uh, low offices and what you could say what you could answer to to Miriam about this financial aspects uh, regarding the compliance the the data protection compliance uh, what can you say about that about mm -hmm. the cost of uh, one type of uh, yeah, it has a cost, <laughs> a human cost and uh, technical costs uh, too. Uh, you know, we are providing also a technology, so we are, are really concerned about the GDPR uh, ourselves. 
and we did a penetration test, a cyber security audit. So it's really, really uh, heavy uh, in terms of costs. Uh, of course, some, so some companies like Google, Facebook, they have so many lawyers, so many quality managers, etc. So it's like being compliant, uh, it's like an effort of two or three months and it's done. But you know, at the end of the day, Google is not really compliant because they're not willing to do so. So I think uh, for small companies, they need to keep in mind that like, um, their compliance will not be perfect. They can they will use all uh, the financial means they have uh, since they are small to do really the the the. the the critical, uh, critical uh, um, things on the companies, uh, and when you are friend, when you are an authority and data protection authority, you understand that, you know about the the sanction, the fines uh, in GDPR. It's uh, uh, you can go to four millions uh, of, uh, of of euros uh, on fine, etc. So you can imagine a company with two people, uh, they will not have four millions of fines. So this is like a proportional thing you need to, 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 to think about. Uh, for instance, when you are we're doing the compliance for a small company of two or three people, uh, and where, where we are doing the compliance of, uh, I don't know, 1,000 people company, uh, there are not the same difficulties, there are some problems. Uh, it can be easy uh, in a small company, you know, it can be really fast. Uh, and for us, I don't know for the other DPOs, for us, we are trying to to be to be um, I don't know to be nice with the small companies because you know uh, they are so small, but they want to do the things right in the right way. Uh, so I think it's an important thing to keep in mind. Okay, th thank you, Nesrin. And I, I want to I want to come back uh, to this uh, beautiful slide. So this slide is this one. When apps get your medical data, your privacy may go with it. And I would like to know if with all the, all the mobile app uh, we, we have on our mobile phone, with all these mobile app uh, directly or indirectly uh, addressing our health uh, or state of health, do we go uh, to a sort of society of surveillance. Mm -hmm. So I'm not an Edward Snowden, but I'm, yes, I'm, I'm very, um, yes, I'm very upset to see all these uh, scandals um, such as um, Cambridge Analytica uh, mm -hmm. and, and all the scandals uh, regarding uh, um, health data processing with or a national uh, security, social security also. And I'm wondering if we go to this type of society of surveillance. What, what do you think yeah. about that? Uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's totally the case uh, because we're, we are using so many apps, so many uh, free apps, mostly uh, uh, using the data just uh, like. Uh, you know, a pump, I don't know how to say it in English, but uh, they, they are just uh, using the data and selling the data. That's why some, some, so sometimes you, someone is calling you. Just before the, begin, the, the beginning of the webinar, someone called me. I was like, where did you get my number, you know? <laughs> so uh, it's not public. So, uh, you know, um, I think we're going to this, and that's why the awareness is really, really important because... Uh, um, we need to face it, uh, and you know, I was, I was thinking, uh, uh, yeah, you know, the, the Black Mirrors uh, web series, you know, this kind of web series, or, or we're like in the future, but it's not really the future; it's uh, present for for us. Mm -hmm. uh, right. And you know uh, what you were saying, think like, uh, in the past uh, with your data, I can tell you who you are. Now, with all the data I have, maybe I can tell you who you need to be. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, I think, uh, the most, uh, the most uh, 
upsetting because uh, people can tell you who you need to be uh, mm -hmm. and change change your mindset, change, uh, uh, influence your uh, your behavior, your decisions. So because they have your data, this is this was the case of Cambridge Analytica and all the scandals we didn't even know. Uh, I think this is the big uh, the big risk mm -hmm. here. With this surveillance, uh, we can see China. China is a big society of surveillance because uh, you, know, <laughs> uh, you have a social, yeah, social. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I, I mean, th this is why GDPR. I think, uh, yeah, for some people, some companies, mostly it's wow, another regulation, it's too heavy, it's costly. But no, 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 guys, it's regulation for our. Uh, rights and uh, uh, our freedoms uh, after all. So this is important to keep in mind to to, 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 to like say, OK, so, players, we always start to play a little bit. <laughs> so it, it, it's very interesting. And, and this question about privacy uh, raises a lot of question uh, behind uh, this field, uh, such as uh, philosophical questions, legal questions. Uh, technical questions and the area is um, yes is very vast and uh, yes I, I hope that in the, in the future uh, we we find uh, the the appropriate framework for our companies uh, or project in Europe related to healthcare or not and uh, I believe maybe in the in the for the future that the GDPR um, begins maybe a day, uh, the gold standards. So I've seen that in California, uh, yes, the, the, the California uh, lowers or uh, the, the California politics um, adopt, uh, starting to adopt this, this type of, of regulation, uh, pick up some uh, interesting points uh, in, uh, in their uh, regulations. And I think that the GDPR is is maybe somewhere uh, one gold standard uh, for uh, data protection, and maybe uh, maybe a day a ch Chinese uh, will uh, <laughs> will go to the maybe. GDPR, uh, <laughs> maybe uh, you, you, you other, right, maybe. <laughs> no, you're right, yeah. Luca, because now they understand uh, countries understood that um, this kind of regulation is like soft power. You can uh, just uh, block uh, some other countries to to get your data. Yeah. You know, GDPR is like uh, is like art, is like uh, cinema. It's mm -hmm. it's maybe our soft power uh, for us, uh, the European citizens and uh, the European institutions. And I believe uh, for the future that the GDPR, uh, yes, uh, will spread. Um, out of, of our barriers, uh, our European barriers, uh, such as in, in US. And I, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic for that. So thank you, Nesrin, for, for your presentation. Uh, we, yes, we wish, we wish you all the best uh, for, for the future, <laughs> for, for your company and for your team. So I, I want to, uh, to remind the audience that uh, VivaTech uh, starts today. And we have some tickets for, for students and also uh, entrepreneurs. And more, more exactly, we have a promotional code for, for entrepreneurs. So if you want to, uh, yes, if you want to get this pass, uh, don't hesitate to contact me directly. And I, all, I, I would like to, to also say that uh, the feedback, the feedback form we, we set with uh, with our team, with uh, with our EITF alumni team, is very important uh, to keep uh, to keep working on this on this topic, innovative topic um, such as privacy. And uh, please to uh, to fill this uh, this survey and uh, and give us uh, just after the conference. So thank you, Nesrin. Thank you for your presentation and all the You're best welcome. for for the. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you to you. Thank you. Bye.